Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 286 if you're listening to this at time of release. Hopefully I'm over in the US at this point. So uh, hello to those of you who have met me over there or are about to and uh, well hello to everyone else as well. <laughs> you never know where I might show up next. This week the questions are taken from guides 358 and 359. That's to the two county class heavy cruisers HMAS Australia and HMAS Canberra with further questions from the Wednesday videos on the Battle of Trafalgar, concluding the story of Admiral Horatio Nelson, and of course the voyage of the mighty El Glorioso, Spanish treasure galleon dash warship, and then a guest question or two from the second video diving on the wrecks of Midway with John Parshall. So let's begin. Graham W. Kidd asks, how did a county Kent class cruiser survive five kamikaze hits. That's amazing. Well, it's all down to where you're hit. So you can actually see most of the kamikaze hits in this picture. The first one hit on the port side of the ship in the area of the anti-aircraft battery, which if I'm reading the damage report correctly, essentially accounts for kind of the burn marks and so forth that you can see roughly center right of this picture around the second and third funnels. Then another kamikaze, which is the one whose impact you can't see, hit between the four inch guns on the starboard side, so on the opposite side of the ship, so in roughly the same area, like a kind of amidships. Then you have two larger aircraft, both of which are actually shot down, but at the last minute. So they hit the water and basically aquaplane skid into the side of the ship. So Again, if I'm reading the damage reports correctly, one of them would account for the scratching and so forth you can see at the waterline to the right-hand side of the picture. And then the other one hits just below the bridge, which you can see on the left-hand side. And yes, that is a big hole in there because that uh, twin-engined aircraft it actually had a fairly large bomb on board which detonated when it contacted the ship, whereas obviously further down the ship on the right-hand side of this picture it was, well, either just a plane or the plane which, with a bomb the other set of first plane was carrying, didn't detonate for whatever reason. And aircraft themselves are relatively lightly built compared to a 10,000 ton ship, especially if you happen to be slamming into the armor belt, which you can see is uh, rather present here. And then the final attacker, believe it or not, you know, even without hole in the ship, it did induce a bit of a list, but they corrected for it and the ship was still going to remain on station. The final attacker went for the bridge, missed, ended up smashing into various bits of the upper superstructure, including the foremost funnel, which is why it's all bent over like that. And even bending the funnel over like that wasn't, strictly speaking, a reason for Australia to be withdrawn. They could have just cut the broken bit off and kept going, although it would have been a little bit uh, smoky up there. But the main problem was that on its way past the bridge and into the funnel, the plane actually ripped through a lot of the ship's radar and wireless systems, without which they decided it was probably best for the ship to go back and get everything patched up again. Squalfy asks, how did the 8-inch guns on the county-class ships, like Australia, compare to the 8-inch guns on American heavy cruisers? So if we look at the variants of the 8-inch 55 that the US used on cruisers that are contemporary with the county class, rather than obviously the 8-inch 55 that you'd find on the Des Moines or even the Baltimores and Oregon cities, which is you know, further mark variations thereof. So comparing that with the British 8-inch, the British gun is a 50 caliber weapon, the American gun is a 55 caliber weapon, but even with the fact the British gun is ever so slightly shorter, it's massively lighter, or rather, the American gun is massively heavier compared to almost every other 8-inch gun. So the average weight for the British gun is about 17.5 tons. The American gun is about 30 tons. It's not entirely clear why the American gun is so heavy, but there you go. 
in practice, the rate of fire on both guns is about the same. You, there's all sorts of figures thrown around, but wartime use seems to indicate that the average rate of fire is about three to four rounds a minute, maybe five rounds a minute if you're lucky for both sides. So, you know, bit of a wash there. HE or HC shells are pretty much a wash as well. They're within a couple of pounds of weight of each other in both overall weight and bursting charge. The AP or semi-arm piercing shell, depending on which gun you look at, is a little different though. Although again, the weights are very close, 116 kilos or 256 pounds versus 260 pounds or 118 kilos on the American guns. The American shell carries 1.7 kilos or just over three and a half pounds of explosive the british uh, shell carries 5.2 kilos or 11 and a half pounds of explosive so assuming that the shell actually gets in to the target the british shell is likely to do considerably more damage because that's a proportionally very high amount of explosive Muzzle velocity is similar, but the American shells appear to be slightly more aerodynamic. If they're fired at uh, 75 feet per second faster than, at least using the AP dash semi armor piercing, the American shells are a lot flatter. And on other installations of the American gun where they're firing at 2,700 FPS, so only 25 FPS slower than the British gun, whilst the performance out to about 10, 15,000 yards is similar. Again, the American gun seems to require less elevation to get out to the longer ranges. In terms of total elevation, however, the British gun does have the questionable ability to fire at extremely high angles, because when they were originally designed, there was talk of them being dual purpose. So you can, in theory, crank the uh, British gun all the way up to 70 degrees, believe it or not. And lastly, of course, you have armor penetration values, now that's a little bit of an interesting one because it depends on which sources you use. The US armor penetration values are fairly well known, but there are a couple of different listings for the armor penetration of the eight inch gun on the British cruisers for semi-armor piercing. And if you use one set of data, the armor penetration for the British ships is very slightly less than the American. So, for example, at about, roughly speaking, 16,500 yards, the American shell penetrates 6 inches or 152 millimeters of armor, whereas the British shell penetrates just over 140 millimeters of armor. So not a huge difference, half an inch di penetration difference. Um, whereas if you, you know, ramp back up the tree, you find, for example, at about 12,500 yards, the American shell can penetrate 8 inches of armor, or 203 millimeters, whereas at roughly the same distance, which is you know, 11,300 meters or so, the British shell is penetrating about 170 millimeters. Although, you know, we're still talking about quite close range. So at the, the closer ranges, the American shell seems to have a greater penetration performance but it's dropping off towards parity as you get out to more towards more realistic combat distances but you've also got to factor in as i said from other sources the fact that shells generally are tested against their own nation's armor whereas if you apply the known ballistic properties of the shells to other people's armor as was done on uh, navweps by nathan oaken you can actually see there's a, there's a huge table there which shows the penetration values varying quite considerably at say around 14 15000 yards there's as almost as much in fact slightly more than an inch difference in penetration depending on whether you're shooting at british american italian german or japanese armor but broadly speaking the weight of evidence seems to suggest that at expected battle ranges the British shell will penetrate very slightly less than the American shell, but not by much. And then, of course, as I mentioned, it has a considerably larger boom when it actually does get inside the ship. So, you know, it swings around about for that. They're, they're very actually comparable weapons. The main advantage or disadvantage, I would say, looking at all the data, is probably the fact that the American one is just that much heavier. You can almost get 
at least weight-wise per gun, two British guns for the weight of one American. The man formerly known as commenting as what I do asks, we've always heard about how Constitution and other American say age of sail warships were often built using multiple types of wood to create a stronger hull. Did any other navy in the age of sail try to do this? And if so, what combinations did they use and how effective were they? Yes, the use of multiple wood materials or wood species was very common across different navies. Of course, you know, what makes a good keel or frame or side planking is very different to what makes good deck planking, which is very different to what makes a good mast. So masts obviously were usually very different from what you'd make the hull from. However, in terms of the hull itself, which I think is what you're getting at, some of it comes down to just wood availability. You know, if there's wood that will do the job or addresses a certain problem with a particular structural element like keels, you don't want them to bend. So you actually want wood for a keel that's got a very twisted grain, because if you have wood that has a grain that is relatively consistent or very slightly consistently bent off, then it's more likely that your keel will bend, uh, whereas a very twisted grain on a keel on keel wood will actually ensure that it will probably stay straight for longer and in harsh conditions. Well, now with that all that said, obviously there may be a wood that's ideal for a particular usage, but if you don't have access to large amounts of it, that's no good for you. Um, and also, you know, just because a wood is very very good for that particular element of the ship doesn't necessarily mean it's the easiest to work with. So something that's 90% as good, but 200% easy to work with might get used instead. So for example, uh, especially these days in Austra Australia, Jarrah wood, absolutely superb for building wooden ships. It's incredibly tough, incredibly long lasting, incredibly strong. It also tends to blunt saw blades like there's no tomorrow. So you can, and indeed they have built some wooden re ship replicas wholly or partially out of Jarrah wood. But I can tell you whoever was in charge of sharpening chainsaws and saw blades in the area they were building them was a very, very happy man during that period. Um, or unhappy if they weren't being paid enough for it. But um, when it comes to European warships, elm was a preferred wood for the keel. And if you could get it for some other big structural elements, obviously classically oak would be your framing timber. And then when it comes to the decks, the decks, whatever, you can get your hands on softwood, easy to replace, um, is usually used. But when it comes to the side planking of the ships, that's where you see quite a bit of variation. Because if you're building a big, heavy, first-rate ship of the line that's going to get shot at an awful lot, and you want as much durability and longevity as possible, then a typical European ship of the line, especially a British one, would have oak sides. HMS Victory, for example. However... If you're building a frigate, and a frigate is obviously not quite as heavily built as a ship of the line anyway, and you want speed, therefore you want less weight, then whilst you might still build your keel from elm or oak, and you might do your framing from oak, the planking, the side planking, you might do from some kind of softwood, maybe pine. Now, that will deteriorate faster, but pine is quick growing, relatively easy to replace, and because it's much less dense than oak, the overall weight of the ship goes down, and thus you might end up with a faster sailing vessel, which is much more important in frigates. Just don't expect it to stop anything much more than pistol shot. And soft or green woods, which are different, so soft wood is obviously things like pine and fir, uh, whereas green wood is freshly cut unseasoned wood, both of these could be used to build ships in a hurry when you don't have time to season large amounts of wood. So War of 1812 on the Great Lakes, an awful lot of ships were built out of either green and or soft woods. So they didn't last too long afterwards, but you could get them in the water a lot faster than if you were trying to build up proper wood stocks. And again, the regionality comes into play. So if the Royal Navy was building wooden ships in India, they tended to use teak because teak is another good hard wearing wood that's available or at least was available in very large quantities in India whereas oak doesn't really show up all that much over there and the Spanish when they're building in the great shipyards of Havana used a huge amount of mahogany which okay it's quite dense quite heavy but it's incredibly strong 
and probably is a good chunk of why Havana built ships were held to be better than ships built on the Spanish mainland. And in the US, obviously, they were relatively fortunate to have access to two different types of oak that were both incredibly strong and incredibly good for shipbuilding, again, as long as you could get the tools to actually hack your way through the stuff. Katana asks, in World War II, how far could torpedoes turn from their launch angle and how and how far could they run out before they made this turn? Was it immediately after leaving the tube or could it be varied? It depends on the torpedo. So as you can see with this diagram, there is something called the reach. So when the gyroscope ring, if you want the torpedo to turn, is set at a certain angle. So you can see here they've wanted it to turn approximately 45 degrees to port. Then, and you know, that can be set automatically or can be set manually. You fire the torpedo, torpedo spins up its gyroscope and will initially go in a straight line for, and that's the distance of the reach. And then at some point the, it will kick in and go, oh, okay, the ring of the gyroscope actually says I should be pointing this way. So I'm now going to be pointing this way. And that will then obviously through the control mechanisms, bring the torpedo around to the new heading. You could in theory, depending on the torpedo, have a different reach for each torpedo. And if things go wrong, you could have the torpedo turn pretty much the instant it leaves the tube, and then you've got a circular run going. But for most torpedoes, exactly how far away from the sub it's going to go before it makes its turn is pretty much going to be fixed by the mechanism that spins up the gyroscope. Later torpedoes, they were able to introduce timer delays to this, and then you ended up with torpedoes that were sort of halfway between the old straight runners and fully guided homing torpedoes later on, which of course can actively change their course multiple times during their run. And these were designed for use against convoys. They weren't that much used to be fair against a big ship on its own, but against a convoy where there's lots of ships, they were useful. And then what that had was an automatic system that actually switched the gyroscope ring back and forth consistently on a timer thus making the torpedo zigzag back and forth. And that allowed the torpedo to sweep a much larger area. So if it missed its initial target in a convoy by zigzagging backwards and forwards across multiple ships' paths, there was a higher chance that it might actually hit something, even if it wasn't necessarily what the submarine was originally aiming for. Greg asks, the US armed forces are notorious for friendly fire incidents amongst their allies, particularly during World War II. Uh, he says, my grandfather's Australian army camp in Papua New Guinea was shot up by US army forces as a by way of example. Does this same reputation apply specifically to the US Navy? And if so, is there any statistical evidence that that reputation is deserved? In World War II, the US Navy does, in its first year involved in the Second World War, have a slightly higher than average number of Fire, friendly fire instance, that much is true, um, especially if you look at uh, Robert Lundgren's latest analysis of the first big night action, i.e. Hie Kirishima and Friends versus Callahan and Scott, uh, where huge numbers of US Navy ships were hit by their own side. But you also have incidents like First Savo Island, where Chicago, as seen here, almost shot up Canberra uh, when it came back. So... You you could argue maybe based on that that it is a little bit deserved, but then on the other hand, you have a navy which one is in its first year of war, whereas okay, so so are the Japanese, but everybody else has been at war for a few years at this point. And as surprising as it might sound, this is the first major conflict that the U.S. Navy has gotten heavily involved in, where there is significant enemy naval opposition. And the US Navy is taking part in prolonged, large scale and complex naval operations. Because if you think about it, before that, what combat experience does the US Navy have? In the age of sail, you've got ultimately relatively small conflicts like the Quasi War and the War of 1812, technically the American War of Independence, although that's technically the Continental Navy, operations against various pirates. Then you've got the American Civil War. Although, obviously, you know, that's a civil war. It's not against overseas opponents. Then 
again, number of small conflicts, but then you've got the Spanish-American War, which is probably the US Navy's single biggest live action combat up till World War II in the age of steam and steel, um, particularly steel, because obviously uh, American Civil War is iron. Then you have World War One, and whilst the US Navy is involved in World War One, it is nowhere near as heavily involved as, say, the Royal Navy is, and it's nowhere near as heavily involved as it would be in World War Two. So, <laughs> yeah, it's actually surprising when you think about it how how late the US Navy is to full scale, you know, straight up peer opponent warfare, where they're actually getting really heavily stuck in. With all that said, in terms of, you know, my ship shot up your ship, San Francisco shooting up Atlanta, Chicago was shooting up Canberra, etc., etc., that seems to mostly die away as the US gets a bit of combat experience under its belt by 1943. Although minor incidents here and there do happen. However, post that, so 1943 onwards, and within mildly increasing frequency in 44 45 what you ten tend to see is friendly fire incidents that are not surface action i accidentally shot up a ship that i thought was an opponent you know with lots of main guns but a lot of sorry mate i was shooting at a japanese aircraft and you happen to be in the beaten zone past that aircraft because of course you know, the US Navy by the end of the war is covered in a truly absurd number of 20 mil, 40 mil, and five inch guns, spitting out a huge amount of ammunition at Japanese kamikazes and less suicidal strike aircraft, whilst operating in relatively speaking what counts for the Navy as close formation, which means that inevitably someone somewhere is going to get hit by a stray five inch shell or 20 mil and 40 mil rounds falling out of the sky and so on and so forth. And some ships even still bear the scars of that. But that's not, obviously, it's, their friendly fire incidents are all unintentional, but it's also not deliberate, i.e. no one actually went, I'm aiming at that ship and shooting at it. They were shooting at an aircraft and shells overshot. So it's like a slightly different kind of friendly fire from, I think this ship is the enemy. Oh, wait, it's actually friendly. BK Zhang asks... Besides Admirals Yi and Nelson, what are some other examples you can think of where an Admiral won an engagement posthumously? I'd nominate Scott and Callahan at First Guadalcanal, given that they did manage to stop the Japanese attack, even if Callahan seemed to be doing his best to try and avoid that. Well, technically speaking, uh, George Carew, uh, who was aboard Mary Rose when she sank, that action that Mary Rose started off between the English fleet and the French fleet ultimately did lead to the French fleet withdrawing, so he, he kind of won. You could make maybe a speculative argument for Admiral Hood at Jutland, considering he went up with Invincible, but Invincible did ultimately kill Lutzow. So, you know, on balance, the trade was in the British favour, although a little bit of a mutually assured destruction going on there. Admiral Tromp of the Dutch Navy is a a little bit here nor there, because he was killed in action, but exactly whether the battle that he was taking part in, the Battle of uh, Scheveningen, I think. Scheveningen? Uh, Dutch people, please phonetically <laughs> put it in the comments. Um, tactically speaking, was actually a loss for the Dutch Navy, but strategically, in terms of the objective they were trying to achieve, was a success, albeit in a grand strategy overall they lost so you know depending on which which element of victory or defeat you want to look at possibly trump bart j bowles asks what is your favorite moment from the battle of trafalgar well i think it comes down to the kind of favorite moments i like in naval battles generally my personal favorite moments are points just before something dramatic happens ideally something that's right on the tipping point you know the fulcrum on which the entire battle can turn because there's so much potential in that moment and so for me the favorite moment of trafalgar is probably when temeraire punches through the franco-spanish line and comes to the assistance of victory um, apart from anything it's 
hugely dramatic because there's a huge wall of gun smoke and then suddenly you've got this massive three-decker come bearing down out of it, followed by the rest of Nelson's column of ships. But also it it signifies so much about that battle because, as I pointed out in the video, at one stage in the battle it almost looks like Nelson's gamble has actually failed because victory hasn't made it all the way through the Franco-Spanish line. She is, okay, devastated Bucentar, but she's now caught up with Redutabla. And down in Collingwood's section, Royal Sovereign has been similarly tied up with Santa Ana, big Spanish first rate, and the ships immediately behind him are being shot to pieces quite con quite enthusiastically. You know, both uh, Belle Isle and Mars end up pretty much dismasted, but still fighting. But you know, at that point, it's almost, almost like the British attack has stalled out. Everyone who's involved right up at the at the sharp end at that point is either engaged in place or very badly damaged. And it's at that moment when Temeraire, followed by the rest of uh, Nelson's column and, of course, the, the rest of Collingwood's column further down when they come barreling through the smoke pretty much undamaged because those lead ships have taken all the pounding that's when you know that the fight is really on and they're able to obviously come through pass into the franco-spanish line start engaging ships left right and center temer obviously comes to help victory and then it's all back on again so that i think would be my favorite moment of all Close second, of course, has to be the run of HMS Africa down the entire vanguard of the Franco-Spanish line, because who doesn't love that? Brendan Boersdorf asks, Given how the French and Spanish manoeuvred poorly at the start of the battle, do you think there was anything a better admiral could have done to improve the French and Spanish battle performance, or were they doomed to fail no matter what? Yes, there's plenty that could have been done. Whilst sometimes people can, believe it or not, be a bit too harsh on Admiral Villeneuve because at the end of the day, he wasn't a complete incompetent. Um, virtually anyone of flag rank in the Franco-Spanish fleet in that battle could have done a better job than Villeneuve. Um, I mean, for one thing, whilst the Franco-Spanish formation wasn't exactly brilliant, it was somewhat tighter and better organised when it was heading south for Gibraltar. The sort of vague crescent arc, all sort of hodgepodge chips to the left and to the right, port and star, but obviously spaced out and clumped together, which is the line that Nelson ended up driving into. That was thanks to Villeneuve bottling it at the last minute and ordering everyone doing a 180 to come back and go into Cardiz. I don't think Gravina the Spanish Admiral, Magon in uh, the, the French fleet. I don't think either of them or any other number of the senior Franco-Spanish officers would have made that mistake. I mean, apart from anything, you've got Cartagena and so forth on the other side. So if you want to run to a friendly port, you might as well, rather than doubling back in a disorganized formation, essentially towards the British. But there you go. So yes, most of them probably would have done a, a better job. And on a larger scale, I suppose the other thing would have been that instead of sitting mostly idle in Cardiz and leaving training of the crews pretty much down to the individual captains, and I mean, that does have some pretty good results when you look at certain vessels that like uh, Algeciras, Egla, um Redoutable, etc., where uh, or even Intrepide, where they're fighting quite hard because they've specialised essentially in in boarding actions because they're stationary. So why not practice those? A truly competent admiral, I can definitely see Magon doing it. Probably Gravina as well would have instituted fleet-wide gunnery practice, even if they're not training in actually you know the, doing the actual shooting of the guns because you don't want to shoot up your friendly port. Just gun practice, you know, practicing loading, running the guns out, bringing them back in, swabbing them out, reloading, getting the gunners up to speed, which you can do while stationary, would have helped the Franco-Spanish cause quite a bit as well. So, you know, combine somewhat better gunnery on a fleet-wide scale 
with a slightly tighter formation, and the whole thing could have been a lot, lot closer of a battle. And, you know, some encounters were pretty close, even as it was. When Anne then asked, it's often held that in order to upgrade the Iowas or the Montanas to the 18-inch guns, that they would need to go from triple turrets down to twins. However, the Tillman designs were able to fit a triple 18, or even a sextuple 16-inch, on roughly the same beam. Why were the 1940s Americans less confident that they could do the same as their predecessors had theoretically planned to? Partly, you've got to remember that the Tillman turrets were never actually fully designed. They were very much sketches. So exactly how big they would need to be would be something that you know might be adjusted a bit later on. But one of the other major differences is hull form. Because remember, the Tillmans were not particularly quick. The Montanas were much faster than the Tillmans, and the Iowas are faster still. And that leads to some rather interesting changes. So what I've done here is I've taken on the top, this is the top-down view for the Tillman 4-2 battleship design, which has triple 18s. And on the bottom, I've taken a top-down view of a sketch for one of the preliminary Montana class designs, and I've obviously scaled them to the same size. That's not obviously strictly accurate because they're not exactly the same length, but it serves to give a fairly good idea. And bear in mind, this is Montana, so she is the slower of the two modern vessels in question. Iowa, the problems would be even more pronounced. But... What it shows is that as a result of the need to travel faster, the hull form of the Montana, particularly up front, is somewhat slimmer than the Tillmans. The Tillmans, whilst not having the slab side that the Montana and Iowas do amidships, it's just about a continuous curve, it has a fairly broadly consistent beam. This is the Tillmans pretty much for the entire length of where they're proposing to put guns. And then it tapers down to the bow and stern. Whereas, as you can see with Montana, and obviously, again, more so with Iowa, you've got a very tapered bow that is still you know, quite heavily tapering back past the front two turrets, only really reaches full beam around the secondary battery. And although on the Montanas it does stay mostly wide getting further back, it then starts to taper back to a point that is a little narrower than the Tillmans by the time you get to the last turret, and on Iowa, you know, the problem is a bit more exacerbated. And bear in mind, this is only a sketch of one potential Montana design, but the point is the general principle. And what this means is that it's not about how much width you have up on the top of the ship, up on the, the main deck, to put the barbettes. It's about how far down the ship's hull goes. Now, if you've seen uh, one of the more recent videos a few weeks ago from Battleship New Jersey, on Battleship New Jersey's YouTube channel, uh, Ryan there actually goes to the barbette of turret 16-1. I'm almost called it turret A, but it's a US ship, so it's turret 16-1, the first turret. And he's actually standing between the barbette and the back of the torpedo protection system. And it's a very narrow gap. And you can kind of see why, especially if you look at where 16-1 would be on the Montana, which is on the far right there, you can see how much less space there is, how much less beam width there is compared to the Tillman battleship, uh, which is the top half of the picture. And obviously as the hull slopes inwards, as it gets lower, lower, lower and lower down, then if you try to put a triple 18 inch on there, the turret and therefore the barbette would necessarily have to be a bit wider than a triple 16. And that might end up with the barbette either in contact with or pressing into and thus forcing a narrowing of the torpedo defense system. And I think I don't need to tell you why having a barbette that is potentially the final stage of defense in your torpedo defense system is probably a tremendously bad idea. Believe it or not, it's not, which is what I thought it might be at first, 
anything to do with the actual depth of the torpedo defense system. Although the way the torpedo defense system is constructed is different on the Arvis and Montanas versus the Tillmans, the actual depth of torpedo defense system, at least at maximum depth, is broadly similar, somewhere between 17 and 20 feet, depending on how you scale which particular cross-section on which particular drawing. I think the Tillmans work out at almost exactly 18 or 18 and a half feet. Um, the Iowas and Montanas are, depending on where you are, along along it either very slightly narrower or about the same. So essentially you could, in theory, have triple 18s on a Montana or an Iowa given their overall maximum beam, but you would have to accept a much slower vessel, which would allow you to fill out the hole form enough to fit the barbettes and the magazines inside the torpedo defense system fore and aft. John Doe asks, you keep mentioning the time period of the channel. What time period is that and why? So this is actually covered in the FAQ and I think maybe the channel intro video, but you know, there's always new viewers, so probably worth repeating occasionally. The channel, broadly speaking, covers 1750 to 1950. I will go back before that, but not usually after. Uh, when I go back before 1750, if there is enough research material to you know present a coherent topic, then I'll do so. If it goes very far back beyond 1750, so you know when you're talking Anglo-Saxon, Viking and then ancient times. Most of the time I'll try and get a subject matter expert to come in and talk about it because I, whilst I do know an amount about those periods, I don't know as much as I would like to as enough to be confident to come and tell you this is the fact, this is the thing that happened. Um, I mean, as we saw with the Battle of Actium, historical sources often very much disagree themselves and records are sparse to non-existent in terms of like no there's no order of battle fleet list that survives from actium for example and so people who have studied this for years are you know probably the better bet at passing on that kind of information and you know people picked up on that kind of thing in the greek fire video that i did so while i'm pretty confident on all the bits and pieces I was saying about Greek fire itself, which is as much engineering as it is naval history. Uh, at one point, because I was reading uh, translated source and the way it described it to me made it sound like it was describing a people, but those who were a bit more well read on literally Byzantine politics pointed out that actually it was describing the inhabitants of a, a city which was part of a theme which was essentially like a state or a county within the Byzantine Empire, not a separate nation from the Byzantine Empire. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, people who actually study the Byzantine Empire in some detail know. Um, whereas someone whose interest in land mostly consists of, can I get the raw materials from it to make ships? And can I use this bit of it to host my ships? You know, in that case, would make a mistake in the, because of the context of what was being said. Now, winding forward to 1950, the cutoff date for 1950, which roughly is basically the Korean War, is for a few reasons. Um, firstly, politics. Once you get much past the Korean War, you start to talk about the Cold War, Vietnam, Falklands, Gulf War etc etc and because a lot of those conflicts are still somewhat hot topics politically i've noticed that when you try and cover them or when other channels have tried to cover them an awful lot of the comments ends up with massive numbers of people shouting at each other about how their side was right or wrong or whatever i mean just look at the flak poor old operations room got when he did a video covering one of the naval engagements between India and Pakistan in one of the Indo-Pakistan wars in the 70s, I think it was. Never mind the fact that he was pointing out and highlighting a battle that India won, he still got a bunch of rabid Indian nationalists jumping down his throat because of all things, he hadn't used a map of India 
that they particularly approved of. I mean, they can go jump in a lake as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, you know, <laughs> simple petty things, but they're near enough to modern history that people get all het up about them. And I'm sure if I do anything about the Falklands War, you'll end up with at least three or four people in the comments who go, go on about the usual conspiracy theories about in the Falklands, you know, claiming Invincible was sunk and, and that kind of stupidity. It's like, you know, never mind the fact that I've met several people who were aboard Invincible and they are decidedly not drowned or part of Davy Jones's crew. Um, and also, you know, they haven't really thought that particular conspiracy through because if you believe the whole thing, you also believe that Britain was capable of putting together an entire Invincible class carrier and sea harriers and replacement crew in six weeks to cover up the loss of Invincible, at which point what possible hope do you ever have of winning against a country that can magic up an entire carrier, albeit a small one, in less than two months? And, you know, I don't need that kind of stupidity polluting the comment section so uh, that's one of the reasons uh, another reason is because some parts of naval operations in those in you know, the post 1950 era is still classified um, and related to that quite a lot of weapons capabilities are still classified and that is a bit of a problem because I like to be able to back up everything that I've said. So if someone says, oh, I think you're wrong about this, I can say, well, he either here is the source that I used or the sources that I used that say that this is the case and this is why I said it. And if you disagree, show your sources. Or I can say, well, these are the balance of sources. These are the different arguments. This is why I decided to go with this argument rather than that one. Or, you know, if it's something else, and then I can point to say, well, look, this source said this, this source said this. And connecting the two, it seems logical that therefore this, and you know, if that was a, if I made a minor mistake in that, then okay, so be it. I I can I can admit to that. That's not a problem. But if you want to say talk about I don't know the first Gulf War, and you want to start talking about Aegis systems and standard missiles. Yeah, there's a bit of a problem there because I can either say, well, according to publicly available information, the standard missile goes, or let's say the SM-2 goes this far and has this capability. Except that anybody who sails on an just destroyer will know that that is not true. And there is a different set of capabilities. But if I say, you know, well, it can do this, then the people who serve in the Navy or who manufacturer who might be listening to it will go yeah he's wrong and if i say actually this missile or this radar or this sonar or this torpedo or this electronic warfare system can do this and i am actually right that leads to some rather interesting people showing up at the front door and uh, well that's not good for anybody well it might be good for some people but it's not good for me and frankly that's kind of important to me um so yeah the classified nature of weapon systems is a bit of a problem going post-1950, uh, at least for the kind of content that I make, you know, where people get into fairly interesting discussions and where I tell you in fairly extensive detail about how things like fire control systems and guns actually work and what their capabilities are. I mean, heck, even for World War II, there's still stuff about the Sinky of HMS Glorious that's classified let alone stuff that, you know, is post-World War II, like the exact capabilities of nuclear-powered submarines. Now, that's not to say I shy away from post-1950 subjects completely, um, because sometimes ships that are built in World War II, for example, will continue to serve through into the post-1950 world. That's why we've got a battle-class destroyer in front of us for this question, because they served well into the Cold War. So if a ship starts out in World War II, or basically pre-1950, as a class and they continue to serve post-World War II, then I will do my best to cover the rest of their career. However, um, when it comes to their post-1950 post systems, I'll tend to refer to the fact they have them, not so much to their precise capabilities. So, you know, for example, like with the Battle-class destroyers or even uh, the Sea-class destroyers like Cavalier, I'll mention that they have 4.5-inch guns, and I can tell you a lot about their 4.5-inch guns, but when it comes to the fact that like, Cavalier has been fitted with CCAT missiles, I'll say, well, she has CCAT missiles. 
they're short range air defense missiles. That's pretty much it as far as I'm going to be able to say. The other exception is if people are willing to come on the channel and talk about something that they have done that postdates 1950. So, you know, we've had Captain Larry Sequist on a couple of times. He commanded USS Iowa back in the 80s. And, you know, he is telling what his story about what he did. So he is the authoritative information source at this point. Um, we've also had people talking about HMS Bristol, the Type 82 destroyer. We've had a, a few other things, and there may be a few other bits and pieces lined up, perhaps talking about the Falklands War with people who served in the Falklands. But in those cases, I am presenting you the information that is being told to you by someone who was there, ideally, who therefore is an authoritative figure or someone who's done extensive research on that. So at that point, if you have questions about what they're saying, you go to them rather than asking me about that because you know I'm just going to put my hands up and say look I'm sorry I don't understand that period in as much detail as I do world war ships from World War One, World War Two, or the Napoleonic Wars or something like that. Hopefully that gives you some clarity. Primark 359 asks suppose if instead of improving on the design of USS Olympia the US Navy had started up an early version of the Essex print production run and just built a bunch of USS Olympias in reasonable numbers. Could the US Navy have been run as a respectable jeune école fleet for a number of years, or would they have become too obsolete too quickly? The US Navy spent most of the 19th century very comfortable with a fleet based around commerce raiding and avoiding major fleet engagements, so I suspect the doctrine had to be attractive to at least some naval officers and the various life forms that lurk in the shadows of Congress. I mean, as I covered when I originally did a video on Olympia, and then when I visited her as well, Olympia is actually a very capable design for her time period, you know, one of the best cruisers launched in that time period, and a small fleet of them would have made the US Navy quite a formidable opponent on the high seas, at least as far as you mentioned, as commerce raiding went. However, the reason they stopped building Olympia-style cruisers was because the US Navy was transitioning from a jeune Nicole fleet into a full-scale battle fleet, and with the limited amount of money that Congress was prepared to grant them for this, if you're going to build big expensive battleships, you can't also afford big expensive cruisers. And also with Olympia's design, meaning that some elements of that were configured primarily to help with long distance commerce raiding, she was less useful as a fleet screen fleet protection cruiser, in no small part because you just couldn't have as many of her, and as I say, so there are some other design elements as well. And so the US transitioned over to building smaller cruisers for fleet protection, which is why Olympia, despite being a cruiser, still ends up as a flagship because she's bigger and carries more and heavier guns than a lot of other cruisers that are either contemporary or shortly after her. And to be honest, you know, given some of the capabilities of the so-called scout cruisers, peace cruisers, protected cruisers, whatever, yeah, I, I honestly doubt their actual utility in the battle line, but there you go. At least there were a reasonable number of them, even if they were going to just serve as shell sponges. The two main problems with a large fleet of Olympias would have been, one, by the mid-1890s, whether the time Olympia is entering service, because of the extremely rapid advance of technology, there are people who are putting into service full-on armoured cruisers, which are faster, better protected, and more heavily armed than she is. She is, after all, a rather large, fairly well-armed, protected cruiser. And, you know, with the best one in the world, she's not going to win a fight against those armoured cruisers. The other problem is the Spanish-American War, because if the US had stayed with the Jeune Fleet, i.e. not built battleships, and just had a slightly larger number of Olympia-class cruisers, then... Whilst the Spanish Navy in the Spanish-American War didn't exactly cover itself with glory, if you look at the performance of Olympia at the Battle of Manila Bay, you know, what guns hit what and did what amount of damage, a theoretical, any number of the battles that happen in the Caribbean, where you replace all the bigger, heavier US ships with copies of Olympia, it could take a lot longer to win, and you may end up losing some ships. You may even let, end up losing one or two of the engagements. 
simply because those ships would have just been quite tough targets for something like Olympia, which was basically one of the major downfalls of the Genical in total. Donovan Lawler asks, of all the naval warfare films you've seen, which in your opinion are the most and least accurate? Well, bearing in mind that, weird as it might sound for a naval historian, I don't actually have that many naval warfare films in my list of films that I have actually watched fully through, mostly because I'm you know, I'm either doing something that's not naval history related um, in my personal life, or if I'm looking at naval history, I'm looking at the things that actually happened. Now, that's not to say there aren't good naval warfare films out there. There, there obviously are. There are some I'd like to see. But, it, you know, life circumstances have conspired to the point that I just haven't seen that many at this stage. So with that in mind, I might relatively limited um board of films that I have actually seen all the way through. Weirdly enough, in terms of most and least accurate, I would have to say that parts of the same film actually tick both of these boxes. So, and that film, as you might guess from what's in front of you on the screen, is the recent, I think it's 2019, Midway. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, and some of you will have heard me say this before, it almost feels like Midway was done by two different teams when it comes to what's shown on screen in terms of historical accuracy. One team, presumably with some good historical consultants, indeed some of the historians you've seen on this channel were consultants on that mo movie, one team got things, you know, some of the most accurate that you will ever see on film. You know, if you line up the damage reports of which bombs hit where and when on the Japanese carriers at Midway, and then you go back and watch exactly which bombs hit where and when on a Kagi and Kaga and so on and so forth, and what effect they had on the ships, you might as well call it spot on accurate. You know, if some scenes, if you put a black and white filter and a few film grain scratches on it, maybe blurred it up a bit you might fool people into thinking that literally was a picture from that battle. Unfortunately, the other half of the production team, the ones that think that Japanese destroyers have quadruple torpedo tube launchers instead of bow guns, and that Congo-class battlecruisers can morph between the you know being an actual battlecruiser and a destroyer at will, and Japan built a dozen Yamatos, and every carrier in the US Navy is a Yorktown class, and every battleship in the Navy is a Pennsylvania class, including uh, the fleet oilers. Yeah, that half, that half need to be taken out and deep sixed, <laughs> because frankly, they ruined <laughs> my enjoyment of that movie to quite a significant degree. It's kind of like, little islands of historical accuracy where you can come up and breathe before having to have your head shoved under the submerged detritus of the horrible historical inaccuracies that pervade between those segments. DM Phoenix asks, I noticed a peculiar event during the Battle of Tsushima and wanted to ask your opinion. When Admiral Rosesvensky was wounded, he and nearly all the officers aboard the flagship Suvorov took the opportunity to escape aboard the destroyer Winyi. I think. Only a lowly midshipman remained with the crew, presumably as their now commanding officer. The battleship was not abandoned and technically still engaged in battle, but was heavily damaged and left with practically no leadership. Aside from these aforementioned officers who escaped, there would be no survivors from the Suvorov's 900-plus crew when the ship was sunk in battle a few hours later. What was that all about? How could officers act in such a manner as to leave a battleship in this way? Why not surrender or abandon ship to at least give the men a chance? Was this a case of cold-hearted upper-class officers treated, treating enlisted sailors as expendable? There certainly, I think, was an element of the officers going, stuff this, we're saving ourselves, and, you know, all these conscripted peasant scum can go, literally go die in a fire. But... It, to be completely fair, there are a few mitigating factors. I mean... For Admiral Rosesvensky personally, I think he would have kept on fighting. Um, that he certainly seems to have been his character. He was taken off with the other officers, but he was taken off 
unconscious, having been knocked out by shell fragments and blood loss. So he doesn't have any culpability in this particular matter. Uh, the other thing was, well, you know, internal communication systems aboard th these kinds of ships were not particularly brilliant and in the first place, and Suvorov had been very badly mauled already by the time it was evacuated. So even if the officers had wanted to announce a general abandoned ship, the chances of that message actually getting anywhere particularly far were pretty slim. Now, with those mitigating factors in place, yeah, if the officer class has decided we're we're out of here, the absolute minimum you should be doing is telling everybody else to abandon ship as well, because you know the whole point of leadership is you know in the title you lead, you know people follow your example, you lead by example. If you continue to fight, as I think Rostovsky would have continued to do, then people will follow you, and arguably, you know, everyone stays at their posts. But if the officers, the people who are supposed to be in charge, decide we're going to skedaddle, well, the very least you owe your men is to tell them that they should run as well, using your men as essentially meat shields to try and ensure your personal escape. Um, well, let's just say that uh, in the past, people have been shot at, after court-martials for less. Um which is why I'm fairly glad poor old Rosasvensky was hauled off unconscious, because that would have been a very black mark to tarnish what otherwise would have been a, uh, you know, a fairly significant set of achievements in getting the ships to Tsushima and fighting as well as they did, even if it didn't quite work out as well as he'd hoped. Jeffrey Connolly asks, in your opinion, what warship could be considered a naval equivalent of the fairy swordfish, meaning you know, somehow... The ship should, on paper, have been bad, but circled around to becoming one of the best. There are plenty of candidates, but I'm personally going to go with Victory, because by the time of the Battle of Trafalgar, she's exactly 40 years old from time of launch. And when you look at the lifespan of first-rate ships of the line, although they do tend to last longer than most... Ships of the line at age 40 are really usually on their last legs. And to, to be fair, Victory had been considered to be on her last legs slightly earlier and then had a uh, re big refit, you know, the so-called Great Repair. But for a ship that old to be not only fighting fit, but the flagship and still one of the fastest and most powerful ships of the line on the planet once you factored her crew in as well as her armament because obviously there were ships carrying more guns than her that is really unusual for 40 years old as i said most first rates didn't reach 40 in active service and those that did were usually not long for this well to be fair there was one older first rate at trafalgar that was the britannia which was further back in nelson's column but she was only a few years older, and she went basically off duty the year after. Whereas Victory, although she bounced back and forth a little bit in the latter part of the Napoleonic Wars between active duty and being used as a prison ship, she was actually technically on frontline service in some way, shape, or form for another about almost two decades. So her actual active lifespan if you add up pre and post Trafalgar as a either on duty or on call first rate ship of the lines, almost 60 years, which isn't bad <laughs> for any wooden ship. And you know, to be fair, Santissima Trinidad wasn't too much younger, but Santissima Trinidad had, of course, been through that massive rebuild that turned her from a three decker to a four decker, and that was comparatively recently. And Reo, another Spanish three decker, Actually, the original ship was older than Victory, but again, she had actually been launched as a two-decker and been taken in and converted to a three-decker first rate, again, comparatively recently. And of course, neither Reo nor Santissima Trinidad stayed in active service after Trafalgar. Now, obviously, technology wasn't advancing quite as fast in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, but still, a ship that's 40 years old leading the fight... Just going by timeline, that's like HMS Dreadnought, not the 1906 one, the previous one, the one that's a slightly uh, out overgrown version of Devastation and Thunderer leading the Battle of Jutland.
or Admiral Lee downing Kirishima, not with the USS Washington, but with USS Ohio BB-12, one of the main class pre-dreadnoughts. Or someone, say, for example, in the 1980s, resurrecting a bunch of ships that had been built in the early 1940s and putting them into service to lead their own surface action groups. Oh, wait, that did happen. That's the Iowas. (laughs) So, you know, technically speaking, the Iowas could also be classed, at least in their 1980s and 90s service, as a form of, you know, seagoing fairy swordfish. And finally for this week... André de Coult asks a few bits and pieces about the Battle of the River Plate 1956 movie. How would you rate the historical accuracy of the battle depiction, not counting the ridiculously small shell splashes, uh, taking into account they actually used World War II veterans, including INS Delhi, formerly Achilles, uh, who was actually there, and allowing for the uh, understandable unavailability of a Deutschland glass, instead using USS Salem. Also, how would you rate the underway exchange between ships at 15 minutes 34 into the movie, the Nelsonian-style summoning of captains, and what type of uniform is worn by the person in the left back at 46 minutes and 14 seconds? And last element, in the scene at 1 minute 45 seconds and 45 minutes and 11 seconds, there's a depiction of cleaning up gun barrels, similar to how you described it in Dry Dock 153. Okay, a lot to work through. I'll try and get through it as quickly as possible. How would I rate the historical accuracy of the battle depiction, apart from the shell splashes? Well, you can actually quite clearly see when you freeze frame it like this that, for obvious reasons, when they're putting shell splashes around the ships, they're using models. This is very obviously a model of USS Salem, not actually USS Salem. Um, You know, for movies like this, bearing in mind it's a 1950s movie, you've got to give them an awful lot more slack than you give modern movies. CGI isn't a thing. You know, decent model work is barely a thing, to be perfectly honest. The fact they've actually gone out their way to get full-on actual warships and you know a lot of people, either you know a lot of naval or ex-naval personnel involved in the film is a huge leap forward um, when it comes to storytelling for this kind of commercial product. I mean, they do a a much better job of it than, again, a lot of more modern historical movies. And, you know, given the limitations that they have in terms of you can't actually shoot up ships, and there's no substitute really for doing that, um, that I think the the battle depiction is probably about as good as you could expect them to do with the technology of the time. Um. In terms of the underway exchange at 1534, as for the underway exchange, uh, which you can see here, this kind of breeches boy style um, exchange between the uh, not Salem and the supply ship, it's, well, it's pretty much spot on because they're actually doing it. You know, you can't get much better than that. This is actually a side-by-side between two ships and... And that is consistent with how they would have done it. Uh, the Nelsonian-style summoning of the captains, on the one hand, that is a bit of uh, film invention. It didn't actually happen. On the other hand, it's actually a very, very good scene. It's entirely consistent with the film and with the, you know, the tone, if not the actual historical fact of the actual battle. And it's very useful because, of course, in reality... Harwood had already devised these tactics and just needed to communicate which set of tactics he wanted um, the, his other captains to use. Whereas, you know, just sending, you know, an order, send this prearranged plan via the wireless, that doesn't help the audience. So by changing it to a scene where he sits down and explains to them exactly what he wants to do, it also informs us as the audience what he wants to do. And thus, I think it, it's a pretty good inclusion, even if it's a historical. And yes, the cleaning of the gun barrels, pretty much exactly as I described. They've got the gun lowered and the rope is attached to the brush, which they're, well, they were pulling through before they were disrupted by listening to the uh, radio broadcast of the wonderful American announcer down in Montevideo. He's a a real, real character. Yeah, as far as naval films go, as I said, once you allow them the slack of being a 1950s film and actually haven't gone out their way to source actual warships, even if they're not the correct ones for the most part, apart from Achilles. It's a, it's just a really, a really good film, really well told. Um, I really like it. 
I must admit, going into it the first time I was going to watch it, I did wonder when I saw, towards the end, when I saw the uh, funnels of a county class, was clearly a county class coming into play, which is Cumberland when she shows up. I thought, well, why didn't they use that? Because, okay, Cumberland, she can't portray Ajax because with actual Achilles there, the differences would be far too stark. But as a county class, I thought, well, you could at least portray Exeter because then you've got twin and eight inch gun turrets and post-war a lot of the counties lost X turrets so you'd even have three of them rather than four uh, but then of course when you see Cumberland come in you realize Cumberland by the time this film was filmed doesn't have any of her eight inch or pretty much any of her eight inch gun turrets left so I understand why they let her play herself but you know just very briefly appearing otherwise you know using town class and crown colonies to stand in for Ajax and Exeter, and then of course Salem to stand in for Grafsch Bay. It's it's forgivable enough. I mean, I I think the the suspension of disbelief you have to put in because of the differences in appearance of the ships compared to their historical counterparts is more than made up for by the fact you're looking at actual warships doing actual maneuvers and firing actual guns and people you know the set cannot be more realistic than it is because they're on actual Royal Navy, at least for the Royal Navy ships, they're actual Royal Navy warships. So, you know, it lends an an air of realism that even a really well-constructed set is still going to be missing uh, for the most part. So, yeah, I really like the film, and thank you very much for the questions. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. I hope you're all having a wonderful time, and I will see you again in another video soon.